Um, well, let's go ahead and get started with the two of you and then hopefully Anisha will, uh, will join at some point. So um, just to kind of give people an overview, the idea here is just to have a, a, a panel discussion of um, opportunities uh, for people with a background in neuroimaging and related fields uh, outside of academia. So, so non-traditional routes uh, 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 in industry, in different industries. And so uh, I hope you all ask questions. So I'm essentially a moderator. And so feel free to ask questions and I will uh, channel them. Um, but to start, I just wanted to give our, our, um, our panelists, uh, Chris Chatham and Chris Gorgolevsky, this, that's also going to be confusing, right? So maybe if you have questions for specific people, make sure you <laughs> use initials. Uh, so I wanted to give them a couple minutes each just to introduce themselves and uh, tell you how they got and what they do now and how they got where they're going or where they are and where they're going maybe. And uh, also I know there may be disclaimers that you have to give, so you can of course use the moment to do that. Um, so why don't we start with uh, Chris C. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, so thanks again, uh, Tal, for the invitation. Uh, this is uh, really a pleasure to get to speak to all the neurohackers out there. So um, I work for a large pharmaceutical company, uh, Roche, or F. Hoffman LaRoche, so it's a Swiss company. Um, and they, uh, in the United States, for those of you in the U.S., you may be more familiar with the uh, company Genentech, it's a subsidiary of, of Roche. Um, so I've worked for Roche for about uh, four years, and uh, before that I was at Pfizer, so I've done a little tour of uh, big pharma. Uh, and I was at Pfizer for about three years. Uh, but my background really is in uh, cognitive neuroscience with a heavy emphasis on imaging and computational approaches. Um, so it's been an interesting uh, journey uh, in pharma that I'm kind of excited to, to share with you. I see Anisha has joined. Um, hi, Anisha. <laughs> she's, she's been promoted to panelist. Hey, Anisha. We were just doing uh, some introductions. So um, I'll keep going and then we'll, we'll come to you, I'm, I'm sure, in a moment. Yeah. So. Uh, I guess my background uh, then was in sort of classical um, basic research uh, in cognitive neuroscience. Um, so I did a postdoc at Brown. Um, I uh, met Tal when he was doing his postdoc back at CU Boulder while I was um, doing my PhD there. Um, and the move into industry uh, was prompted actually kind of out of the blue. I was looking at the job market as a, as a kind of junior postdoc. Um, and had some questions about whether the traditional academic path was exactly uh, where I wanted to go. And then uh, there had happened to be an email on the faculty listserv uh, at Brown uh, related to a uh, cognitive neuroscience group at Pfizer. Um, and I, I had a phone call with them and sort of quickly learned a whole lot of things um, that m now strike me as potential misconceptions about, um, about what industrial research is like in concert distinction to, uh, to academic research. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing um, from the other panelists on that topic more and of course the discussion and sharing some of my own thoughts. Great, thank you. Uh, Chris G. Oh yeah, hey, thank you. So, so I uh, also am a recovering academic. Um, I've been uh, in science for eight, ten years. I've been, did the whole PhD thing, a couple of postdocs, then a research associate and I ended up directing a center at Stanford. Uh, and then uh, I've tried to take it to the next level, which is uh, becoming a PI, getting a lab. And so I, I put myself in the fray and applied for around 50 jobs on three continents and got one offer uh, out of that. And um, a great place uh, in terms of people, but it wasn't a great fit personally. Uh, but but that also sort of sent me a message that maybe the set of skills I, I, I deliver there are not in high demand. And uh, so I decided to um, uh, look for other opportunities to, to make a living. Uh, and I've been interviewing for a bunch of companies, but uh, eventually uh, ended up at uh, Google. Uh, and I can tell more later how that happened. Um, and, and here comes the disclaimer, <laughs> I can talk about my personal experiences, but I'm, I'm not talking on behalf of the company. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and Google right now, I've, I've been at Google research, uh, before, and now I'm in a, in a product team and Google analytics, uh, and I'm technically a software engineer, but I do a lot of product related work, uh, as well as, um, 
uh, things related to machine learning uh, and sort of scoping out machine learning products and analyzing data and then productionizing uh, all of that stuff related to uh, mostly analyzing uh, web traffic and app traffic uh, using Google Analytics. And that's me. Great, thanks. Nisha? Well, sorry I was late. Um, so I'm Anisha. I got my PhD at UCSF Berkeley's Joint Bioengineering Program in uh, Roland Henry's lab, which is a neuroimaging for multiple sclerosis lab. Always been interested in translational research, and I was very much against industry and startup life, especially being in San Francisco, because that's all like random people talk about on the streets. So I was really annoyed. Um, so I really had shut my mind off to, to startup life. And of course, that's where I work now. I'm, I'm working at a startup. Um, after my PhD, I did a postdoc with Ariel um, at the University of Washington at the eScience Institute. Um, and this was an amazing experience. And while there, I started to apply for, uh, I applied for one faculty job, did an interview, and then I didn't get it. But I also realized that maybe academia is not the place for what I want to do, the type of translational research I want to do, and I might actually be more effective in industry. So I had to open my mind up, and now I work at Octave Bioscience, and I love it. So I'm um, happy to talk more about that. Great, thanks. Um, so I have a couple of sort of very general questions I'll start with just to make sure that we cover them. But do please, there's, it's great, there's already a bunch of questions, so do uh, keep throwing them out there, and I will, uh, uh, I will bring those up. Uh, so I guess the, the first question, this probably is on many people's mind, is sort of just the big picture, um, how each of you would compare, recognizing that obviously you have sort of an N of one or N of few uh, in industry and or academia, but just your impressions, like what the big differences are, big misconceptions, et cetera. Um, so maybe I'll start with uh, Anisha. Um, um, so I feel like my case is really unique because my company hired me for my PhD and postdoc research, and they wanted me to basically continue it in an industry setting. So um, I mentioned at my talk yesterday that I'm often shielded from the other parts of the company that I don't want to do, like marketing or like product management, which I still don't know what that is. Um, so I pretty much do do my research that I would have been doing in academia, just in, in industry, and it's really great because. We have people that are cloud computing experts and I can just ask them questions and they, they help me out. So I'm pretty happy. Um, misconceptions. I think a big misconception I had was that everyone is just in it for money and like capitalism is bad. And uh, <laughs> the reality is everyone at my company, at least like they genuinely are there because they want to help people. Um, and we have to earn money so that we can continue to help people and build programs to help people. Um, so that, you know, after interviewing with them and talking it, I was like, oh, wow, I really had a bias going into this and that, that wasn't correct. So. Great. Um, Chris, uh, I guess we'll go on my screen. We're going that way and then back at least for this question. Chris G, any, any thoughts on like big differences? Uh, well, there's plenty of differences, uh, there. I think the, the thing that surprised me the most is that people have much better, um, work-life balance it's something that is uh it's just completely different from my previous experience and of course like my personal experiences are you know n equals one right so uh so before joining google i've been sort of like obsessing about work problems constantly uh, weekends evenings and and whatnot uh, work was life, life was work. And, and that was mostly for people I've been working with as well. Um, and, and at the company right now, it's, it's much more, much healthier, basically. It's sort of nine to five, you finish work and then, uh, you don't expect anyone to, to bug you, uh, or you don't expect anyone to reply to your emails either. Uh, same with weekends. And that allows you to, uh, maintain, you know, relationships, have a family and, and basically be a, a normal member of society. Um, and obviously there are exceptions, like for example, today I'm on call. So this thing can like go off uh, anytime, also during nights and whatnot. Um, but those are, you know, special on-call um, procedures um, that, uh, 
that we are also like extra compensated for and whatnot. So there's a lot of respect for, for that work-life balance. Yeah, Chrissy. Yeah, it's interesting uh, hearing Anisha and Chris uh, talk about this because I, I actually hadn't thought of the kinds of contrast that you highlighted, although they're both, uh, I think, also true in my experience. So um, in Big Pharma, I'm, you know, fully isolated from the commercial side of the organization. All the marketing and so forth happens, you know, after all the research is done effectively. Um, and, uh, and like Chris said, yeah, there's, a, there's definitely a, a better work-life balance, although there are exceptions in certain cases, right? If something happens in a trial, then we need to address that uh, quickly. Um, but the way I had thought about the contrast is in, in some somewhat different terms maybe than, than we've discussed so far. So, you know, one difference has to do with the nature of funding. So, and not really funding limited, um, and I imagine the same certainly applies for, for Chris and maybe Anisha too. Um, so, I really have never seen an idea that I believe in um, go unfunded. Um, I sometimes decline to pursue, uh, you know, funding for certain ideas because I get convinced on the basis of initial feedback that maybe it's not as good an idea as I thought, but um, that's really not a constraint. Um, I think another thing that's different is, of course, so there's no teaching responsibilities, not formally. It's actually the dialectic between student and teacher that's different, not the absence of teaching. So um, I work with people with hugely diverse scientific backgrounds from kind of like medicinal chemists um, to behavioral pharmacologists. And there is mutual education uh, that needs to take place in the context of those more cross-functional teams. So I don't think it would be right to say that there's no continuing education, but it doesn't have that sort of classical teaching dynamic. Um, yeah, I think that I think that those are the, the big differences, really, from my point of view. Great, thanks. Um, I'm noticing that uh, some people are upvoting questions. Please do that. A few people are, but, but definitely read through the questions and upvote them because we're not going to get, I can already see we already have like 16 questions. We won't get to all of them. So if you upvote them in order them for me, I'll just sort of pick off the ones at the top that people uh, that people are particularly interested in. Uh, so let's start with the one that's right at the top right now. Uh, and I'll just open it up and, you know, we can navigate interruptions, et cetera. Um, I have faith in, in all three panelists to uh, to behave. Um, maybe not Chris G, but, but uh, um, so one of the major benefits of the academic career path is the possibility of tenure. How secure industry jobs typically? especially startups. I guess the general question is like, what kind of security is there in, in the industry? Um, I don't know who wants to answer that. Feel free. I feel like I, sh as the startup person, should, should tackle this. Um, I was really worried about this. Um, but I guess at the time, the uh, first of all, the economy was doing very well back in October. Um, and data scientists were getting hired all the time. So I figured it doesn't hurt to try this because worst case, if it doesn't work out, you know, I can always find something else. But uh, the reality is that startups generally have a thing called runway. They, they raise a bunch of money and then they like spend it over time and then they raise more money, series A, series B, that kind of stuff. So as long as you find a job that's a good fit for you and you're, you're productive and you get along with your, with your teammates, um, even in a recession like we're in now or whatever, um, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the next like three years. Um, I'm, I don't know what's going to happen in 10 years, but I also, I don't know that academia is that much, I mean, it takes a while to get tenure too, right? So you don't know how long it's going to take for you to finally secure that permanent position. And also what if you don't like it, you know, so you put all this effort in and you secure this position that's secure, but like you haven't tried other things in the meantime. So for me, I don't think I'm, I'm like done with academia. I mean, I'm still coming on to this and I still chat with Ariel and Tal. Um, I'm not like closed off to academia. I just think that it is worth considering other options and it doesn't hurt to try something new. Any other, other uh, takes on that question? Again, I can give a few thoughts. Uh, I, I think it's definitely uh, an attractive option, this, this tenure thing. I agree with Anisha completely that what if you get a tenure uh, at the you know location you hate uh, and you know with faculty members you don't get along with sure you've got job security but uh, but you're still unhappy right so um, so that's problematic in terms of uh, industry uh, the bigger the company the less likely is that you're going to get laid off because bigger companies have more 
uh, cash set aside to like survive uh, uh, things like recessions. Uh, but technically, it's California, all California's employment and will or something like that. It's uh, it's basically there. There isn't uh, many many things put uh, put in place to, uh, to to protect this formally. But but keep in mind that these companies put a lot of effort, like a lot of resources, into recruiting you and into training you, especially big old companies that have tons of systems that are internal that will take you months to understand them. And now if they're gonna lay you off and, and then hire someone else when the times get better, it's gonna be six months wasted uh, again. Uh, but uh, I think an industry and probably Chris C is uh, more uh, able to talk to this is you should expect to switch companies uh, and sort of move between places uh, every few years. Uh, I don't find this as a, a downside because you learn more, you experience more. Um, and, and I think part of the advantage of Google, for example, is that it does so many different things. So sometimes you don't, if you're bored with one project and you want to start working on self-driving cars, there, there, there is part of the company that does that. Uh, so, so it enables you to explore this without actually leaving the company. Yeah, maybe I could add a few thoughts. So uh, again, I agree with the other panelists. Maybe we'll encounter some some divergences later. But um, yeah, I think with more cash on hand, some of these concerns around getting laid off are a little reduced. Although in pharma, it is worth saying uh, that there are several uh, companies that have exited neuroscience. So depending on how targeted you remain um, to problems in the neuroscientific domain, um, then there can be challenges uh, along those lines. I think for me, there's there's two thoughts I want to get across to, to the, the audience on this. Like one, I think security is a little overrated. I remember being a postdoc and contemplating the possibility of a second postdoc in some less than ideal place and then possibly taking an early faculty position, um, but then needing to move again before I get tenure. Um, and actually in the shift to industry, I've realized that I just enjoy what I'm doing so much. I, I'm happy to do it for as long as I can. The other thought I wanted to share along the security lines is that while individual companies may decide that they're not interested in pursuing neuroscience today, the uh, unmet need doesn't go anywhere and remains something that lots of companies are investing in. Um, there's new, new partnerships and so forth announced all the time. So again, I think uh, it's, to the extent it's not a kind of an illusory concern, I think security is overrated. Uh, top top uh, next question is, uh, how did you decide which type of industry jobs you wanted to apply to? And do you find that doing data science in industry is, is quite similar or very, hey, that's cheating. You snuck in two questions here. <laughs> that's fine. We'll, we'll uh, feel free to answer them both. Uh, so do you find that data science in industry is quite similar or very different than doing data science in academia? Um, yeah, again, for me, because I am doing neuroimaging in my job, it's pretty much the same thing. All the skills that you're learning at Neuro Academy are what I use every day. I'm literally like writing a Docker file right now to launch some processing on the cloud. Um, so I don't, I don't think I'm the, I'm the best person to answer this, but you can get lucky, right? There could be a company out there that wants you for like the exact type of research that you do, and in which case you're going to be doing the exact same thing. Um, how did I decide what type of industry jobs to, well, yeah, again, I got really lucky. So I'm going to pass to one of the Chris's. Yeah, I can, I can speak a little bit to this. And again, N equals one single experience. Uh, I didn't quite decide which type of industry jobs I want to apply for. I basically applied broadly. I had different sets of CVs for different positions. I applied for data science, software engineering, as well as uh, product management. And I just applied broadly and see what sticks. It's uh, uh, in my my experience, it was also not something that you know you, you got an offer from every place you apply for because you've got a PhD or something like that. No, it's it's the, the main difference is that there are many many more opportunities outside of academia. Uh, so so that cycle of applying, getting rejected is just much faster. Um, so, so I, I didn't pick it. Uh, it. It picked me eventually, and then within the company, it's easier to to browse and try to figure out. While you, while as you get in, 
uh, it, it gets easier. Um, and then what do you find doing data science in the industry is quite similar to or different from doing data science in academia. Um, yes, I find it is quite different. I mean, academia is all about uh, the narrative. It's all about the paper. It's all about what you write there and how you're going to spin it uh, and, and all of that. And that's what counts at the end. It's that PDF somewhere online. Um, and in the industry, first of all, the, the cycles are, are much faster, like you need to get results quicker um, and and those results are turned into decisions and those decisions will impact products uh, and those products will be evaluated so um, so those decisions are not thrown into the void like they have consequences and depending on the industry you're working in those consequences will be visible either very quickly or later but they will be eventually evaluated uh, because it's, it's not in most cases, there are exceptions. It's not, not just about public perception. Uh, it's, it's actually of like how well different things perform. So your analysis will have impacts. Those impacts will be evaluated. So the stakes are kind of real. I think it's a similar situation uh, for me in Parma. So uh, it's definitely not about the paper, right? All basically the work gets done usually before the paper even comes out. Um, and and I mean that in the, in the sense that uh, much of the work, if there's a negative result, is just as valuable as a positive result, although it can be challenging to publish that. I mean, our problem in pharma is that, you know, there's just an infinite series of molecules that we could be testing, and we need to quickly filter out the ones that actually don't look quite as promising as the others so that we can turn our attention to more productive things. Um, and so I think this, from this point of view, pre-registration of even sort of exploratory strategies for data science becomes even more important um, so that we know exactly how what we can infer from a given uh, negative or positive result. Um, I think there is plenty of opportunity to kind of browse around the different functions. I personally uh, decided on, uh, on well, going to work at Pfizer at first uh, because I just didn't want to give up the biological knowledge that I had at the time, and I, I really wanted to continue working on that biological substrate using computational tools. Um, but then in my years in the industry, I, I sort of like got to see a lot of different types of activities, and there's many doors open in the way that, that Chris described too, um, that if I did decide I you know, wasn't so interested, for example, in neural tissue anymore, I don't see that happening, but uh, there would be plenty of ways to, to, to move to other domains. Great. Uh, so there's a cluster. Actually, some of the top questions are sort of different takes on the same question. So I'll just reword, reword them. And so I guess the general question here is, um, let's say that you, you either want to move into industry or at least you're open to it. Um, how would you go about that? So is there a particular type of experience or internship you should look for? Um, where do you, how do you connect? So how do you know what jobs are out there? Who should you reach out to? What sort of general recommendations about what to do, I guess, uh, the question. So maybe I, I can do it because it, it seems that the jobs found you guys, <laughs> not the other way around. So, um, so again, the, I think the, the big thing about finding a job in general anywhere is luck. Uh, and and that's, that's something you, you cannot forget. It's just like, it, there is no like recipe, I'm gonna do A, B, C, D, and definitely gonna get it, this job, right? No, that just doesn't work. Luck is a big part of this. Uh, so, so how can you help with luck? Uh, basically, uh, we do multiple comparisons without correction, right? So we, we try and try and try and try. So, so how can you help with this process? It's, it, it is applying for a lot of, that does mean applying for a lot of jobs, even the jobs that you don't see yourself immediately liking, uh, because you're just going to get better interviewing. Uh, interviews for data science uh, are getting more and more structured, uh, the same as uh, software engineering, and they're becoming a skill that you need to practice uh, and that you need to get good at to even get an offer. Um, and, and there are plenty of resources of like how to train there, there are websites so you could like find peers to interview each other, uh, and that's super useful. Um, otherwise, I would also, if you're pursuing data science, I would recommend building a portfolio of data science projects. 
it could be on GitHub. It's basically something that you can talk about and you can talk about it in sort of industry terms. You can talk about what problem it solves, why is it important, what impact did it make? Um, and that's, uh, that's very compelling because you're not just a sort of number crunching person, you actually understand the context and that's what, what uh, people look for. A good place to start is Kaggle. Um, many companies sort of like look up to your, your ratings at Kaggle.com, uh, obviously disclaimer, conflict of interest, Kaggle is owned by Google. Uh, but it is a place where you can learn a lot of skills and you can also start showing off those skills to your potential new employers. Um, and then uh, uh, um, meetups is another thing. I don't know if meetups work with global lockdown, uh, but that used to be a thing to, to meet new people uh, as well. Uh, sorry, meetups, yes. And, and the other thing that you should probably invest into is redoing your resumes. The other thing that a lot of these, especially big companies struggle with is that uh, people sort of applying cold, so without any referrals has to be screened. There are so many applications, uh, they have to be screened by computers. Um, so you need to optimize your CV for certain keywords. Uh, and again, there are some services and websites and resources that will help you make your CV not only look cool, but also being parsable. So we'll, we'll go past that, uh, that threshold. Uh, and finally, there are these training programs, boot camps such as Insight and others. Uh, I have not done one of them. I was in the process of applying uh, when I got the offer, but I've heard good things. It's especially good for networking, especially good for preparing for interviews uh, and connecting you with companies. Uh, so they're not going to give you like a project that is part of your portfolio, skills to interview, but also they're going to set up interviews for you. Um, so, so that's why it might be a good uh, worthwhile investment. Yeah, I want to double, uh, second the insight thing. So I also applied and got into it, but then got a job offer. So I never actually went through it. But um, a couple of weeks ago, my company um, heard from 10 or so insight applicants. Um, and I don't, I don't know how else we recruit because I don't really do that part. But it was cool to see um, a bunch of people that were from academia showing us their data science projects. And there were a few people that we actually reached out to after that. Um, so I think the insight network is probably pretty valuable. Interesting. So maybe a few comments from, from my side. Um, I, I, so I think maybe this is one of the, the first differences I've heard come up. So I don't think that anybody at Roche or Pfizer is looking at Kaggle um, leaderboards or um, I don't, I also am not sure that a, a boot camp of the more kind of general uh, form of data science would necessarily make a resume stand out. It is also true that we get lots of applications and that it can often get screened out inappropriately, actually, and it, it, it's quite burdensome, actually, to make sure the HR isn't inappropriately rejecting those things. But I think, at least for, for a pharma career, a big pharma anyway, um, really it would be reaching out to the scientists that you see publishing uh, some of the papers, some clinical trial results or some early kind of phase one uh, biomarker studies, for example, um, and then just sending them a comment. So the scientists are the ones who know what, what needs the organization has, and HR kind of follows uh, that lead. Uh, so positions can be created for the right candidates. Um, and I think just having that kind of um, direct scientific exchange with somebody inside the walls of the organization can open doors that you may not see on a, careers, uh, a, a career site. Um, there are also internship programs at, at both at Pfizer as well as Roche. I know that Lundbeck and Janssen um, also have them. And uh, these are sort of the big players, um, at least when it comes to big pharma and neuroscience. So just speaking out about at Roche, we have a Star Trek internship program that you can look for. Um, but again, both PhD studentships, uh, postdocs, uh, as well as research professional internships can be created uh, for the right candidate. Great, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of questions coming, which is great. I'm, I'm closing ones that are sort of fairly close to, they might not be you know, perfectly addressed, but just because we want to get to more stuff. So I apologize if you, if you don't feel your question is exactly answered. Uh, there's another sort of somewhat similar question, but, but a couple of questions asking sort of, uh, I guess I'd phrase it, what do, you, what do you do right now, right? So like, let's say you're looking ahead uh, to 
potentially switching into industry? Like, is there specific engineering skills or things that you should do while you're still in your PhD or postdoc that would make you uh, more attractive uh, to various industries? Um, I, yeah, I've mentioned this before. I think a lot of the skill sets um, that Neuro Academy teaches, um, being able to work with cloud computing for us is a really big deal. Um, version control with Git and GitHub, all of the, basically all of the Neuro Academy uh, lessons, I would say, are pretty crucial to my day to day. I will also kind of echo what Chris said earlier, which was having kind of like a public portfolio online. I had a website that showcased all the random like projects that I've been working on. Um, and that's really useful because um, the founders of my company like Googled me and like researched me and Google stalked me and they're like, okay, she's a good fit, you know? And so it's good to have your work out there. So putting your code on GitHub is a really great first start. Yeah, I think maybe a, a thought from, oh, right, go ahead. All right, I'll, I'll give it a shot. So, uh, yeah, I think even though maybe Roche and other pharmaceutical companies aren't looking at uh, the Kaggle leaderboard, we definitely do check GitHub um, because we work in such a, a big cross-functional atmosphere. If your code isn't interpretable or reproducible, it's a huge problem, uh, not just for the teamwork side, but also for how much we can really make decisions on the basis of something like that. So. That's definitely, um, definitely good. I think, you know, beyond that, what you can do to stand out. So there are certainly neuroimaging specific careers. Neuroimaging is, is one of the core techniques that we use for drug discovery, um, but there's many different flavors of it. So to the extent that you can show you have some degree of proficiency, not only in one type of MRI analysis, but you've also been able to look at PET data, for example, or maybe you have an EEG data set um, or maybe you have a very different type of, of data that you've worked with as well that's relevant to neuroscience problems. I think there's more opportunities for folks that have shown some kind of uh, facility with multiple data types, at least, in, again, in pharma. But yeah, Chris, thoughts from your side. Um, yeah, so, so there are like different stages of this and there's a disconnect between what will increase my chances of, of getting a job versus what will make me most productive on the job. Recruiting is hard as in perfect. So proxies has to be used and, uh, and those proxies are, are imperfect, but you can, you can uh, maximize your chances of passing these tests. So again, I'll voice over the, the need for projects, portfolio, publicly visible stuff that you can talk about, that is relatable, that is presented in a way that someone who's not an expert in your field can understand and see how this is not trivial, and, and you know, these scales, these models translate to others. So for example, we all in neuroimaging do linear models all the time, right? Uh, so, so pink that skill. Uh, and, uh, and the other thing is that uh, for data science and for software engineering, the interviews are a skill. So when you are, when you're getting to that, like three months from now, I'm gonna start doing interviews. Uh, and you don't want to take any time off, this is probably when you should start training. Uh, and there are, depending on like what, what sort of uh, trajectory you're going to take, it's, it's either doing SQL and probabilistic puzzles uh, and doing, you know, these timed homeworks uh, that some companies send out um, or for more engineering stuff, uh, basically doing those uh, algorithmic puzzles and brushing up on your, uh, data structures and algorithms, especially in the context of now doing it in the browser on a text document and, and like before COVID that was doing it on a whiteboard. It's a completely different set of skills uh, than the normal coding. It's something you have to develop. It's something that uh, you need to really practice. Uh, and, and I cannot stress this enough. I, for example, uh, failed a Google interview many years ago because I just, uh, you know, browsed through a book because like, I was like, yes, like, who's gonna, who's gonna tell me to, to like do this, do this tree search here, right? And, and they did, yeah. So, um, so yeah, you have to basically be on top of your game there uh, and it takes a lot of effort. Do it with friends, find peers, uh, create this pressure situation, basically trying to interview well. 
Uh, another cluster of questions uh, relate to sort of maybe this is sort of more personal side. Um, uh, so feel free to you know qualify what you say is obviously may not generalize, but um, so uh, how did you realize academia was not the right path for you? And the flip side of that is, do you ever have regrets? Um, and in general, I guess to the degree you feel comfortable making generalizations. Uh, so I made the claim in the talk I gave a few days ago that it doesn't, at least my impression has been asked a lot of people, this is like, do you think people are happier on average in this year academia? And it doesn't really seem like there's, right? So, so, it, um, so if you just have, a, I guess a gen general question is, um, do you feel satisfied with the decision? How did you make that decision? And in general, do you think that there is sort of, maybe there's not a single right or wrong, but I mean, can you speak to like, what might make maybe someone happier in one environment or the other? Okay, I can go. Um, I was, I loved my postdoc, I loved my PhD. Um, I don't think I, I don't think academia is the wrong path for me. But at the end of the day, I just want a job that's a really good fit. I want a job because I need to get paid. And I want a job that's a good fit. And I don't think it was good for me to limit to just a certain type of job when I didn't quite understand all the variety of jobs that were out there. So I think that maybe one day if I want to come back to academia um, and academia, like no one will take me because I've been in industry and they don't value that, that's academia's problem, right? Um, I think, I don't think it's, I don't think it's fair to say that academia is closed off to any of us. Oh, and I'm happier, but I was happy before. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, maybe from my side, I guess I, I really enjoyed um, all my interactions during my postdoc and, and grad school. I mean, my mentors were great. All of that was wonderful. I think one of the uh, points of friction for me was like a sense of frustration uh, in the review process, both on papers and grants, that like there was something just really basic, a basic miscommunication that could have been clarified and would have changed the interaction or made it more efficient. It was frustrating to feel like, um, you know, the system was just not, it, was, it felt unwieldy and, uh, and opaque. And uh, so in industry, you know, one of the things that was incredibly appealing about it was that the decision, you're in the room where the decisions get made, right? And if there is a miscommunication, you're able to just rapidly clarify that on the spot. Um, and so that has, uh, you know, eliminated one source of friction for me. Trying to generalize about who's happier in industry versus academia, it's really tough, right? So there's a huge selection bias that operates. Most of the people I'm encountering in the company are the ones who are happy because the ones who aren't have left. Um, but I do, uh, I have seen a few people leave um, and actually return to academia. I wouldn't say that um, there's any, you know, I'm not able to generalize actually in, in that respect. What I would say is that you can go into one of these industry roles, and I think most people probably have enough data they haven't fully analyzed sitting on their hard drive or on their server. You can actually keep up a publication record for a few years and jump back in uh, with actually a, a kind of interesting looking CV in that case too with this little moonlighting experience in an industry role um, that I think could be appealing probably in a lot of academic career paths. So I, I think I would resist the temptation to think about this as a kind of final decision you make about path A or path B, because it's, it doesn't have to be that way. And it isn't actually. Um, so I don't know, Chris, if you have things to add from your side. Uh, happiness, what is it, right? Um, <laughs> um, so in terms of like, yeah, I, I'm just gonna also say a bunch of similar things. I was very happy with my job at Stanford. I loved working with Ras, and I was, I'm very, very proud of what the whole team built together. And each time I see, uh, you know, mentions of Open NeuroVids, NeuroVolt, and all of these fMRI prep that Oscar is taking over, it's, it's just uh, super proud. Uh, but but for me, the signal was that the job market just wasn't there. Like the the things I was doing. I could keep doing them in that one place, but the rest of the world just didn't, just there, there wasn't really a, a, a huge need for, for that. Um, uh, and, you know, on top of that, there is a culture of personal brands and which is emphasized by uh, papers and the whole publishing system in academia is extremely frustrating. The worst experience I ever had in academia were uh, because people were arguing about like, who's going to be on this paper and in which order. Uh, and it's, 
And of course, there are conflicts and there are, uh, you know, overlapping interests uh, in a company, but there are dealt with better. Uh, because there is an entity in which interest it is for all of us to get along and be as productive as possible. And that entity will put in place incentives for us to get along. Um, and I think that works relatively well considering the scale at Google. Uh, so, so yeah, for me, the signal was like, do people want to hire you? And the answer was like, eh, not that many. Um, and, and whether I'm happier now, it's transition was not easy. I have to say that. And it's, uh, it, was, it was tough, especially because um, I had to learn a bunch of new things and I have to, had to introduce myself to a lot of people and prove to them by my work that I can, I'm capable of doing things and I can be trusted doing things. And that takes time basically gaining trust of your coworkers takes time. You probably work with a bunch of people and you gain their trust and you're comfortable. You're going to switch environment and no one's going to care about your papers and you will have to build your trust from zero. Uh, and that will be frustrating, but I think it's well worth it. Um, another question, uh, how would you compare the diversity and inclusion of academia versus industry? So I guess we can generalize that. I mean, in general, do you feel that, that people are more welcoming uh, in industry, um, uh, irrespective of your background? Um, how does that compare? Um, I feel like I should say something about this. So I've been in academic situations where I've been the only woman in the room, and I've been to tech, tech conferences where I've also been the only woman in the room. And the reality is that some academic institutions are going to try and they care about diversity inclusion and those are better for you. Um, same thing with industry. There are some I've interviewed at startups where I would have been the only woman there. Um, it's whether or not someone makes the effort. And I don't I can't say that I know if industry overall makes more of an effort or academia overall makes more of an effort. But I will say uh, as a as a woman in either academia or industry to that it's generally better when you choose a location where they've actually put some effort into diversity inclusion. It's just nicer. So, oh, and I also um, will I guess, say that, sorry, my company did put a lot of effort and actually the majority of data scientists are women at my company, so yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, I think from from the Roche and, and then thinking also back to Pfizer and what I know of other pharmaceutical companies, I think in that case there, you know, there is a widespread recognition that this is a problem and there are various programs to attempt to rectify it. I think that work with varying degrees of success at different parts of the organization. So it's it's almost impossible. And Roche alone has like 80,000 employees. Um, so it's very difficult to make a, make a general statement like that. But I think um, you know, there are programs like this that's acknowledged as, as a challenge, and I think we're all, we're all kind of trying to do our part to work on it. So the group that I'm in at Roche currently, uh, my former boss um, uh, was a woman, and the head of the whole group is a woman. There's above her, um, actually, I think three steps down from the uh, CEO, there's, there's two women on that leadership team. So I think we're working on it. Uh, yeah, I can, I can basically say the same thing. It's a, it's a big problem. It's not solved. Uh, I think it's in engineering overall among industries, like less than 20% of women, uh, which is really bad, especially if you consider like at MIT, uh, there's a parity 50-50 uh, uh, in, in terms of gender when people join. Uh, so uh, it, it's problematic. There's a bunch of things that are being, uh, being done to, to help with this. Again, I personally interacted and work for and with uh, a lot of people from diverse backgrounds uh, and, and it was great. I enjoyed it a lot. I think the company puts a lot of effort into it, but it's not a selfish at all. And, and we have long, long ways to go. So, uh, so, so today you're listening to this and you make industry sound like a, like a wonderful place. I mean, you know, there are some issues, but it, all three of you make it sound like this is great and why wouldn't you want to do this? And so I kind of want to push you a little bit. And there's also this question here and like, I'm guessing this is one of the, the main drawbacks of at least some kinds of positions. Um, so specifically how much research freedom, if you were doing research at all, do you have in industry? And I guess more generally, are there things you miss? I mean, what are the things that, that uh, 
not to make any sort of overall judgment, but what are the things that you kind of miss about academia that you maybe don't have as much of now? I would say, I mean, my research is very similar, but the order in which I, I do things, because, you know, as a researcher, you have a bunch of ideas every day. You wake up and you're like, oh, maybe I'll try this one thing. Um, but I feel like, and maybe a lot of you feel the same way, I have a lot of ideas that are kind of like not always connected to each other, and I just want to try a bunch of different things. In industry, it is important to prioritize which ideas you should try first, um, because there are products that need to come out, and you do, yeah, the product does matter at the end of the day, so I usually... I usually shoot off some ideas to um, other people in the company. Hey, what do you think about working on this? What do you think about working on that? Um, and so the, the ordering matters, the, the priority matters. Um, but overall, uh, I think I, I do have a lot of research freedom. Um, yeah, so the only thing that I miss is postdoc was super low stakes, right? Um, as in, I'm in a translational medicine you know, role right now. And so um, if you came to my talk yesterday, I, I explained it more, but I mean, we, the decisions that I make uh, for analysis and code and everything, that eventually will affect a, a human being. So I do have to be a lot more careful <laughs> with how I, I go about doing things. I can't just haphazardly be like, hey, yeah, yeah, that works. Like, no, wait, let's, let's look at it really closely and make sure everything works well. So it's more high stakes and uh, the priority list um, matters a lot more. So uh, maybe from my side, I guess, what do I miss? One of the things that I miss, um, uh, you know, based on the fact that I'm currently working in this highly regulated environment involving giving, you know, novel compounds uh, to folks is that for many reasons, uh, we're precluded from interacting directly with the subjects or with the sites that are actually carrying out the research. So we're sort of specifying the research protocols, the, the experimental design, all of that, often giving the tasks and other things that are being used specifying the MRI sequences and so forth, um, and then receiving the data. But uh, it can be really frustrating, actually, when you get, um, you get some data back that you know is obviously not correct. And could it, you just want to go into the lab and fix it for them and then go back. And that's not typically possible. Likewise, there's other, uh, I think, along the lines Anisha was saying, so sometimes there's a really simple question, research question, that's in the way uh, of me and an application. Uh, and I know it's a simple experiment to run, and if I were still in my postdoc, I would just then go and do it. Um, but instead, there's a bit more bureaucracy that's involved in actually doing some of these little things. Um, so I think those are, those are two. The other drawback, just so this doesn't come across as like, you know, a big recruiting talk or something, um, is that there are a lot of meetings. And so I did not escape the ultimate fate of an academic uh, PI that will get stuck in faculty meetings, right? We have the same equivalent. Um, and so that, that's a struggle. If, you, if it's really important to you to maintain uh, hands-on data analysis throughout your career, like it is for me, then that's something that you, you really need to actively watch and make protected time for. Yeah, I really miss good quality like data that I have control over acquiring. Yeah, good times. <laughs> Uh, so I can, yeah, I can add some things. It's not necessarily like a total drawback because I think this is the right way of doing things. But the the big uh, the big difference is that uh, you might end up working with a lot of uh, data that uh, is uh, uh, there are a lot of like legal obligations uh, around this data, and you have to be very careful to maintain the. Uh, the contract that you have with your users and to respect their privacy. And, you know, that, that word respecting privacy uh, is, uh, it's, of course, everyone agrees it's super important and it's, uh, and it's something that, uh, that, that we should do. But in practice, that also means that uh, we need to put extra work and, and Google is taking this very, very seriously uh, internally. And that means that uh, it's, it's much different than taking a CC0 open data set from, from open neuro and just playing with it, right? Um, and it's, uh, it's important. I think this is how it should be done, but it's an additional set of procedures and red tape to make sure that uh, no one who, doesn't, who shouldn't see certain uh, types of data is not seeing those types of data. Uh, so that's something that you should 
we should sort of mentally prepare for and then later uh, just acknowledge that this is the, this is how things should be done. So we have uh, about 10 minutes. Uh, the, the, one of the two talks after this is, uh, is canceled, unfortunately, um, but there is another one and also we don't want to run super long. Um, thanks to the, the panelists for taking time out of their, their work day right now. Um, so most of the, uh, I'll have one more question. I'll let everyone answer and then maybe just like concluding comments if there's anything left out. Uh, so I think several of the remaining questions really are asking about um, whether, uh, let, me, let me put it this way, whether it's really even important to do a PhD or a postdoc or like, um, how do you see, I guess, professional or not professional, sorry, uh, formal educational credentials mattering or not mattering to different trajectories in industry? So I can try to take a stab at that. This may be a situation where I don't know if, uh, what Anisha and I have to say is going to be a little different than Chris's point of view, but I think uh, it is important uh, to, to have these advanced degrees um, in order to secure the research freedom, at least again in the pharmaceutical industry that, that I think many of us would want and value. Um, so if you, if you don't <laughs> have that, then the, the problem comes when someone sort of out-credentials you and walks in the room and then says it should be done in a particular way. Well, all of a sudden now, unless you've built up this trust uh, that we've talked about, which takes quite a bit of time, basically the wrong decision can be made. Um, and, you know, you, you may have to contribute to that, uh, the implementation of that wrong decision, which isn't, isn't fun. But I've not had that situation uh, with the PhD, and I don't think in that respect having postdoc credentials on top of the PhD matters so much. It's sort of the letters after your name. Um, I will say that from the hiring point of view, we often uh, will require a postdoc for the permanent role. Um, and so if you, you know, you can, you can join without a postdoc, but then effectively you need to do an industry postdoc to secure that, that permanent role. But I saw Anisha's thumbs up. I don't know, any differences from your point of view? Yeah, no, I, I thumbs up that. I, I don't know that a postdoc necessarily helps unless that postdoc is very similar to, you know, the industry job that you want. So because, um, you know, our, our company is very focused on multiple sclerosis, and if you did a postdoc in a lab that was focused on multiple sclerosis research, then that would definitely make you more valuable than someone who has a PhD in the same thing, but doesn't have as much domain expertise in the field that we're looking for. Um, but yeah, hundred percent agree. I think, I think it is useful to have a PhD just so that you have a more autonomy. So I have a different perspective because right now I'm in the product team and even before in research, uh, Google really praises meritocracy. So in other words, it's not about what title you have, it's about how well you can argue your point. Uh, and this is built into the, the interviewing process. Uh, we have hired engineers without college uh, degrees at all, uh, and, uh, and they can do very, very well. Uh, it's all about their actual work experience and it's all about their actual skills. And it is quite prevalent inside the company for uh, having a lot of discussions with a lot of people independently of their career credential and backgrounds, uh, which means that your arguments have to be always tight, but not only that, they also need to be always uh, approachable by people who might not have exact expertise. It takes more effort, but it makes the whole environment more inclusive because no one's gonna flip out and say like, but I have a PhD, listen to me. Um, so I actually work with people who I later uh, realize actually have PhDs and they, no one ever said that. It's just like, it's, it's not something that is super important. But having said that, you know, I work in a product team, we do a lot of data analysis and we fit models and whatnot, but we, we don't publish paper. We are quite detached from the, the sort of, um, let me just put it uh, in a not very mild manners, uh, egocentric uh, publication sort of environment and all of that. So, so there's less of that. Uh, and also having said that, there are certain very specific positions uh, uh, where PhD is uh, required or um, you, you basically should have it. Um, and to be honest, I, I think that uh, as a training program for a, a, a generalist data science position, a PhD is, is very, very inefficient. It's just so much time 
and you're going to use very few of those skills in your actually in your actual work. Um, so think about it this way. We have some people here who uh, really found a great fit, like Anisha, like you're just doing the work you've been doing before. Uh, but uh, what are the odds that that's going to happen for everyone who's listening to us right now? Uh, and you have to you have to deal with this, whether you want to get hyper specialized and then just, well, I'm definitely going to get that that one position in Northern America that, uh, you know, that fits that hyper specialization or whether you're going to uh, you're going to branch out and have more possibilities that are are less specialized. And that's the sort of trade off you have to think about. Great. So uh, we have uh, just a couple of minutes. I just wanted to give each of our panelists a chance maybe to really anything you want to you want to uh, tell folks who are listening, maybe if there is something you wish, if there's something we haven't covered here and you really wish that someone had told you, you know, five years ago or however many years ago when you were considering uh, your career trajectory. So any just any closing comments of any kind. I wish I had done an internship during my PhD just to see what it was about. So I think I saw some of you asked if, um, if that would be valuable and I think so, yeah. Even if it's not like the identical type of research that you're doing in your lab, just to get a different perspective, try something new, I, I would have done it. So I have something slightly different thing that I wish I had been told. Um, it just so happened that uh, I made decisions that were consistent with this advice, but I didn't know it at the time. And I'm, I'm really glad that uh, as it happened, I, I made the decisions in that way. Um, and this relates to the nature of the roles. So in, in the pharmaceutical industry, at any rate, there's a kind of a team structure that gets superimposed across a whole lot of folks with a lot of different backgrounds. Um, and these are the core teams that are involved in moving a molecule forward. So the closer your role is um, to membership in that core team that's responsible for, for the molecules, then um, the closer you are to all the really uh, fundamental actionable research that takes place and as well to the funding. So um, what you need to take in mind if you take a more peripheral role is that, yeah, you may have less meetings <laughs> um, and you may have a little bit more freedom to work on uh, you know, research questions that you come up with, um, but you're actually not close to the heart of the action um, in the way that you are if you, if you join a molecule team. So I think that's an important aspect of the role um, to think about. Well, I wish someone told me to buy more Bitcoins, but I think that that ship has sailed. Uh, on a more serious note, uh, I think that something that is overlooked in training is that the uh, vast majority of people who start and graduate from PhDs will not be able to get a tenure track position they like. And that's just a fact. Uh, and I think that uh, it's an uncomfortable truth and and that might not change your decision you might if you can you can internalize that knowledge and still pursue uh this as a sort of um self-improvement growing cool experience in your life um uh, or it can in, in influence your your decisions and you might you know decide to uh to leave academia earlier but, but I feel that sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly, a lot of trainees are, I hate the word led on, but, but somehow we get the, uh, the idea that, that we're gonna be like our supervisors because we look up to our supervisors and we want to be like them, uh, but uh, we can be the smartest and the most hardworking and just not lacking enough and, and not be like them. Uh, and this is something that I feel is not talked about enough, uh, that element of luck, uh, because it's also hard to admit to ourselves sometimes that what I've achieved and, and what I represent is, is not just me, my hard work and my genes, it's also a bunch of luck. Uh, and, and I think that's sort of the final message I have for everyone. There's a lot of luck involved. Uh, most of people uh, that graduated from PhD or started doing a PhD, doing a PhD, will not find a tenure track job uh, they will like. And with that knowledge, you have to decide 
uh, what you want to do with your life to be happy. And happiness means something different for everyone. Great. That's, I think, a really nice note to end on. Uh, so this will obviously be, the recording will be posted. Uh, and there are a lot of questions we didn't get to. Uh, feel free to ask in, on Slack. And you know, I can't obviously promise that the panelists will see them or, or take the time to answer because they're very busy. Um, but you're welcome to ask and other people might chime in. I uh, really appreciate this. We want to thank our panelists um, for joining us today. Uh, this was great. Hopefully everyone uh, learned something useful. So thank you all again.